Like cooking, everything has a recipe. A set of instructions to follow in order to gain a certain result. Music is no different. Be it ingredients for a dish, a set list for an amazing show, or a release strategy for a successful launch. These are all recipes. Hi, we're your hosts, Sean. And I'm Brandon. Come and join us in our kitchen as we go through the Music Makers Cookbook. Let's get cooking. Welcome to the Music Makers Cookbook, the podcast where we talk about recipes for success in the music industry. Yeah. How you been? I've been I've been all right. Yeah, this is like the first actual episode we've recorded since the pilot. We had a little test pilot. Yeah, maybe we'll, re- we'll release. No, it, release it's going to be day. released. There's going to be so there's going to be three uh, episodes released at launch. So if you if you're listening to this one and you haven't listened to the other two, when you're done with this one, make sure to listen to the other two. Don't leave now. Um, listen to it because some valuable stuff is going to be spit today. Yes, um, very important stuff that gets you started on this whole journey with us. Exactly. And then we also have one that kind of an episode that talks about um, why it's important to have kind of a, a branding for your music. And then another episode talking about, you know, who exactly are these guys sitting on this couch? Like, why should I listen to them? Right, yeah. Um, and kind of talking about what this podcast is going to be as a whole. So if you haven't seen that one about what this all is, you just had a quick breakdown from the introduction. If you really want to learn what you can fully expect, make sure to listen to that one after this one. Yes. But yeah, uh, you just asked me how I was doing today. Um Doing pretty good. Pretty yeah. I recently joined a gym. I was telling you about this earlier. Uh, I've been eating so much food that I need to work it off. I've been cooking too much. I got, I got this That's, really good recipe. Dude, there's this app called Whisk. Have you ever no, I've never heard of it. Mess with it? Mm-mm. It's um, It's pretty cool. So what it is, people submit recipes to it, and also it pulls from different cooking websites online. And... From there, it tells you all the ingredients you need for a specific serving. Um, you can multiply it easily or make it smaller for single servings if you live alone or just two oh, people that's or a cool. family. Yeah, you can adjust how much you need. And then you can select all the ingredients you don't have at home, and it'll put them into a shopping list. So when you go to the grocery store, you can just check off all the things you need for that specific dish. That's awesome. So it makes it really easy to meal prep. Amazing. For this Whisk app, can you actually put it in ingredients and then it spit out recipes that qualify for those ingredients not that i'm aware of i haven't tested that feature out but Doesn't something that i feature? have done i don't know i haven't gone whisk that hired me you know <laughs> well here's the thing though i have done something similar with chat gpt i went into my cupboard said hey here are 20 ingredients that i have 25 ingredients that i have make a recipe with them doesn't have to include all of them but make a recipe with them yeah and it did and it wasn't like the best thing ever but it was actually pretty good i gave it a bunch of stuff and it had like this um Tuna pepper rice bowl. Uh, oh, interesting. And it was actually pretty good. The only thing that was off was like the sauce came up with was pretty runny and not it was, uh, it was very you. acidic. But gotcha. it kind of worked well with the fish. But it, anyways, so if you want, don't worry, you're going to cook and you just have like, oh, I just have a bunch of staples in my cupboard. Put them in a chat GDP. See what it spits out. Dude, AI is great. crazy. We are doing an episode on AI later. Yes, we will be. Uh, I need to do a lot more research and dive into it. Before Me too. I, I need to use it a lot more it. too. Yeah. Yeah. That's great, though. That's a great idea. I yeah. think I might try that sometime, you know? Because, like, we have... Ah, you said I know. But, but no, um, <laughs> we, we have a bunch of ingredients that sometimes, you know, don't correlate with anything. And we're like, we don't want to go grocery shopping because we yeah. have all these ingredients that don't yeah. correlate. Well, you know, sometimes That's our cool. imaginations don't run that far. So... That might not be a bad idea, dude. I might have to try that sometime. That's Do a it. great recommendation, dude. Let great our computer man. overlords help you out in the kitchen. It, it's coming anyway, so we might as well just succumb, <laughs> right? We might as well just get used to it. Might so. as well eat good before They're it here to help us right now for the meantime. So until, you know, they turn. Yeah. That's good stuff. I love if I started off saying I got a gym membership and then said nothing about it and <laughs> immediately jumped food. into food. <laughs> <laughs> uh, long story short from that first thing, my legs are really tired. Yeah. 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 Anyways, how have you been? Dude, I, I I've been great. Respond. I can't, I'm not going to pull a... Uh, you know, an ungrateful co-host and just completely ignore. Yeah, no, no, you're you. good. Like, so no, how have you been? What dude, is your weekend? You know, been? I, I've been, I've been really good. Um, I also love food, so I could talk about food for hours. This is why we're here. No, I've been great though. Uh, we just got a new puppy about a month ago. Today's actually the one month anniversary of getting the puppy and, uh, she's great. She's a little demon though. And she likes to wake up in the middle of the night and, and not go back to bed. So I'm very tired these past, I've been very tired these past few weeks. So forgive me for any, mistakes along the way but you know i'm human there are no mistakes just happy little accidents you're right you're right yeah. when you can avoid the mistake it's best to avoid the mistakes yes be it you know in the kitchen like you know you don't want to put salt in when you need sugar which i've done before but also it's important not to make mistakes when recording at home oh transition Ooh, that right was there. a good segue yeah dude. you've probably seen the name of this episode 
otherwise, surprise, I guess, what is it, like five minutes in? <laughs> I think we're talking five about five minutes in, man. Yeah. yeah, thanks for listening to us ramble. But no, we're going to be diving <laughs> into getting a better home recording with how expensive going to a studio is and how cheap getting your own recording gear is. More and more artists are recording at home. It's so much, uh, so, so much. There's mm-hmm. a, a lot, a lot of music out there, which ties into us talking about why it's important to brand yourself. But specifically for this, even before that point, it does all start with the music. It yes. all starts with how it sounds and how if it, if it actually represents how you want it to be. That starts with getting a good quality recording. Absolutely. This is why we're kind of branching off here because this is like the first part of being able to market your music. You have to have music to be able to market it. So why not start with creating it, right? So we're just going to assume going forward that you have some working knowledge of this stuff. But also at the same time, maybe not a super huge amount of working yeah. knowledge. I mean, this is the internet. You're here for some information on it, but we're going to kind of talk over the basics, things you can do, and things to be aware of and really think about when recording at home, as well as some specific instructions to make sure that your next song is the best sounding song yet. If you're listening to this and you just recorded your last song and you hate it, this is probably a good place to start because we have a lot of working knowledge in this area and we could actually make probably several episodes about this, but we're going to try to condense it all into one yeah, because go that's not really the main focus of our show, but this is the best place to start. And yeah, we're putting it in the microwave today. We're not putting it in the oven. This is easy bake right here, baby. <laughs> easy bake. This is These are leftovers, dude, you know, as far as I'm concerned. So yeah, man, that's, a, that's where we're going to start today. Let's dive right into it and start off with kind of like some mistakes that, you know, we commonly see. Uh, if you haven't seen the background information about who we are, just a real quick summary. We're both audio engineers. Yep. We also help with artist development. That's really what this podcast is about. And in addition to that, I, I work with singers, songwriters, and folk musicians. That's the genre of expertise that I work with. And, you know, Brandon. Yeah, I'm more focused into the hip hop, rap uh, clientele even though I do kind of venture over into the singer-songwriter stuff too, Mm -hmm. and sometimes into the pop stuff. I've worked on country stuff, worked on metal stuff, so have all kind of have focused in multiple genres, but my mainstay is mainly hip-hop. So So, we we have, I mean, I I know you have too, and focus in other genres too, so we have kind of a working knowledge on what the workflows entail, which is why we feel like we're pretty decent at talking about this stuff because we've been through it so a lot of stuff that uh, you do is is very clean and you know you got to have a good recording quality in order to get a cleanness to it where a lot of stuff that i do is a little more dirty a little more noisy doesn't have to be necessarily the cleanest thing but you still want to follow these best practices so you can add these effects later or even if you want these effects while you're recording be intentional about them yes which we'll talk some stories and that, that that definitely takes some time to develop within itself so yeah Good just just start on a, on a nice, easy, flat surface. And yeah, I think uh, let's get cooking. Yeah. So the first mistake that we see uh, time from time, again, uh, especially because I, I do most of my stuff with remote mixing and mastering. So a lot of times people send me the files that they have recorded at home. And sometimes I have to walk through the process. What I often see when I get files that don't sound good or have issues with them, it's because they're using cheap and bad gear. Now, cheap doesn't mean bad. Right. They're just using both, like a $20 yes. condenser microphone from Amazon yep. or a used Behringer interface from years back. I'm naming dropping gear. Don't really <laughs> want to do that too much, but this episode is going to be all about that. <laughs> Behringer's not going to like that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, a lot of these cheap things are... They do that because they, they, for a reason, they, they cut corners. It's the small things that glue a sound together. It's not the bricks, it's the mortar yeah. that pulls pulls the building together. So if you have this cheap microphone, they're using, you know, lesser, cheaper solder or mm-hmm. not as good cabling between the diaphragm and, you know, whatever. They don't have a transistor in the microphone. All these other things that are playing factors to it, which can get a really either a nasally or a super bright or a way too alive or active sound. So you don't have to go super expensive, but you also can't just completely cheap out. Yeah, you ru- you always run the risk on with cutting corners in audio. It's really hard to know what sounds good when you don't have that experience with things that sound good, right? So if you're starting to if you're learning from scratch right now, it's going to be an uphill battle. 
like to be completely honest and we've both faced this we've both learned on what sounds good what doesn't sound good and in this equipment we can tell like what's pretty much going to sound good and what might not hold up as well over time now if you're getting into this you're like hey i want to dive in i just want to try it I'm not going to put anything out or I just want to just test the waters by all means. If you want to go out and get a $20 mic and a $20 interface, what have you, yeah. that's fine. You know, but once you start getting into this and putting it out professionally and want to actually market this stuff and make this a career, you're going to have to make these choices. And, you know, the value over time is going to pay off expeditiously. Oh, for sure. Because you invested in good equipment up front. And there's a couple of reasons, like a couple negatives that come from not taking, you know, your sound seriously and getting something that actually represents what you do and presents a good quality. Uh, first of all, just, you know, it makes the process more difficult. If you have stuff that maybe is faulty or doesn't always connect, I mean, even beyond microphones or whatnot, if you're using cheap guitar pedals that sometimes short circuit or you're running them through a nine volt battery that oh, yeah. introduces a hum into the signal, you can be chasing problems all day because you're not happy with your sound. And mm -hmm. it's because it's usually the small things that are causing issues. Like the, the dying battery is one of the last things you check, well, it's always the last thing you check is the problem because once you check it, you fix it. Mm -hmm. But it's definitely usually down the list. And you yeah. think, oh, where's this hum coming from? There's a lot of other problems going on. So it can just be a lot more frustrating when you don't have things you can consistently trust that are built well to be used for you know long periods of time again and again, be reliable, have consistent sound. Uh, a lot of the nicer things have like stepped controls. So if you have a tone you like, you can put it back to where you want it. So if you have to record on two separate dates or you want to retrack a part, you're not just guessing, oh, now it sounds 80% the way I wanted it to originally. Well, now you got to re-record the whole thing. So it can be really frustrating not yeah. to have the right stuff yeah. in recording. And to kind of build off of that is you you sacrifice opportunity costs. So when you put in lower value, lower amounts of value into this gear right away, when you make the lower investment, you're actually taking away from yourself in the future because when you go to use a guitar pedal and you're using a 9-volt battery, right, because you're not going to check the 9-volt battery until it's dead or it's dying because it sounds like shit. So you go and you, go, you have to go up to the store because, I mean, who carries around multiple nine volt batteries? I knew it. I knew he was going to raise it. <laughs> I knew it. I knew it. Uh, the audio only podcast <laughs> listeners yeah. are uh, a little confused. Uh, <laughs> I personally don't because I just use the the plug, you know, the nine volt plug. Um, but now you're gonna have to go up to the store, and by the time you get back, you have to deal with the the person running the store. You have to go use your credit card. Now you're mad about spending six dollars on a battery. I don't know how much it costs. Do you have no, do at like legit at gas station, um, like the convenience store things. Buy it. Those are going to be the closest thing by you that sells batteries. They jack those prices. Yeah, up I believe it. Like crazy. I think I paid nine dollars for that's, a nine volt that's battery. That's ridiculous. Last time I went that, there. that would. That's enough to make me mad. It made me. It made me very yeah. mad. Yeah. And it was for a. For me, it was a deactivating fire alarm. But oh, anyway, well, I guess. I guess that's pretty important. But I was still very annoyed yeah. for two reasons. Anyways, go on with your, with your yeah, story. You know, you, you, you take away from yourself in the future because by the time you get back and you want to go record and you're setting everything up, you've lost the inspiration. It's gone. So that inspiration that you could have actually been using to your advantage, right, it, it, it's not going to come back until a later time. So you're actually robbing yourself of time in the long run by using shitty equipment. So just buy decent equipment on the front end, make sure everything works, and be as creative as possible. Because we're going to talk about, there's kind of two hats you wear when you become your own engineer, own producer, you're a technical guy, and you're a creative guy. We'll get into that possibly, if we have enough time today. And another episode probably. Yeah, maybe another we episode. we were really just focusing on, like this is, this is a bare bones, These, you need to be aware of this kind of stuff yeah when doing the recording yeah so in a later episode we'll talk about that some more maybe it's more of a mindset thing when you go to record yourself but by then i mean you've you've already ruined yourself for the day i mean <laughs> that's the opportunity You're done. that's the opportunity cost you've probably burnt yourself out or you only had an hour to record wasted it's gone so yeah that's why we're really stressing to invest in decent equipment up front so you eliminate the frustrations later and you thank yourself later i didn't even think about that like say you got a roommate who will you know is just 
you guys yeah. have a lap over shift. Like you only have an hour between they get back, and you know you don't want to be annoying or whatever. Yep. You know you're you're a nice guy. You don't want to be annoying to your roommate. Oh, well, then they get back by the time you're, you're ready to go recording, and on you can't do anything. Yep. So that's I mean that's a big frustration of just not having you know, the right gear. And Huge. these are things that we've seen people have experience. Not only that, but we've done it ourselves. So yep. please heed our warnings, you know? So, and another thing is, another mistake that I see a lot is, let's say you do have this cheap stuff and you're like, man, I really like this process. I, I enjoy recording myself and I really want to dive into it. Time to up, upgrade my stuff. Oh, yeah. The next mistake that I see all the time is they upgrade the wrong things. Yeah. So I was, I work with, I said, I work, I work a lot with remote artists. They'll send me stuff all the time saying, Hey, you know, what are your thoughts on this? Give me feedback on the recording. Give me feedback on the performance. And you know, I, I love doing that. If you got a song that you want feedback on, hit me up, send it my way. I'll listen to it and get back to you. It's easy to th- get lost in the shine of a microphone and yeah. think that the microphone is a large part of the sound. Like most things, it is a part, but not the largest part. So they'll buy a really expensive $1,000, $1,500 microphone because I want to sound great. And maybe they even went to a store where you can record yourself or listen back to your microphone. And they're like, my voice sounds great on this microphone. That's great marketing right there. Which That would be awesome. Yeah. There yeah. are some stores that allow you to really? do that. Oh, I yeah. I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. I didn't know that. Um, some, yeah, a lot of music stores. Not a, like Even the Guitar Center, you can actually l- sing into the microphones they oh, have a display can. there. You can. They have that. the headphones next to it. You sing into it, and it'll put it back through the headphones. I didn't know that. So a lot of people, you know, you can go to your local music store. If they have the opportunity, you can test out a microphone, and maybe they'll even let you use it for a while and bring it back if yeah. you, know, you don't want it. You can rent out microphones. There's a bunch of things you can try. So they'll buy this really expensive microphone that sounds fantastic on their voice. They get it home. They record it. What they forget is the room. Yeah. And they forget that, oh, my air conditioning's going. And this is a hot micro- condenser microphone. It's picking up the fan. Oh, it's picking up the water as, you know, the dishwasher is running. Oh, it's picking up the slapback delay in this big room or this big reverby sound because it's a very active microphone. They sound amazing, but... They are really good at capturing the sound of your room. Yeah. And that can make it really frustrating on you to get the right sound that you want, not having to having to mix around it. Mm-hmm. Or if you send it out to a remote mixing engineer like yeah. myself or Brandon, you're making it harder on them. Yeah. You make it really hard on us. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> seriously, uh, so, sometimes we get some really great audio that comes through. And even sometimes I'm like, whatever you did here, do that again because that was awesome. That was so good. Then other times it's it's very frustrating because you do get these files that come in and they say, "Hey, can you mix this?" Like, sure. Like, I'll usually I'll listen to a demo and stuff. And and sometimes it's, it's you can't save it. You just you just can't save it. There are too many things in the signal chain. That's what we're referring to, by the way, mm-hmm. when we say the mic isn't the only thing within the the setup. Is is we're referring to the signal chain, and we we can talk about signal chains maybe another time. Um. But we get these, we get these, uh, get this audio in, and and we just can't, we can't work with it. We, mm-hmm. it's just, or or it's going to be a really big fight, and and we're going to turn something into you that is not going to like meet your fancy. You're going to be really upset. Because because here's the thing, software exists where if there is a fan in the room, it can analyze the sound of the fan and it can remove the sound of the fan. However, what this also does is those high frequencies of your voice that overlap with those fan frequencies or the airiness in your vocal that makes it sound right in your face that gone. is great for a pop vocal. Gone. Yeah. Rest gone. in peace. They're gone. Yep. And there are really easy ways to, if you do want to get a real nice microphone, let's say you did test it out and it sounds amazing, there are things you can do within your recording space to n- try to minimize as much as possible for no cost at all to you, mm-hmm. the noise that happens around you. For example, we all have really decent, two potentially good uh, vocal booths yep. in our homes, in our bedrooms, yep. and it's called the closet. Yep, yep. Yeah, I've, I've set a few people up in their closets, and it's and it's worked. 
Okay. I've set people up with clothes in their closet because it actually deadens it enough. That, that's what I'm saying. By when, in your yeah, closet, the clothes is where acts as exactly, a vocal booth. Exactly. It, it helps out tremendously. Might not be the most perfect thing, but at least you're getting better sounding quality audio. Yeah. It could be really good. You could still have problems. And if you still have problems, well, you just spend $1,000, $1,500 on a microphone that is still giving you problems, still isn't giving you that clean solution because what you put in is is what you get out. Yeah. It's, it's the mortar, not the bricks. Yeah. I'll, I'll so Sorry, go ahead. Sometimes, well, I was just going to say, and now you're out a lot of money. That could have been your whole budget. Mm -hmm. Whereas let's say you invest in a dynamic microphone, even a good dynamic phone, like the SM7B that we're using, yep. even the SM58 uh, or 57s, like are, can be really good. People think of them as live microphones, but they can and have been used on albums. I was doing some research for this episode and I, I learned that U2 used the Shure Beta 58 on a couple of their albums. Mm -hmm. And, uh, <laughs> You're going to have to help me pronounce this. Bon Iver? Bon Iver. Bon Iver. Bon Iver. Uh, on his album, on a Emma Forever Ago, for Emma Forever Ago, he used a 57. He used a 57 on pretty much all of his yeah. stuff. And for, for me specifically, for the genres I do, it, it showcases that, you know, 57 can do a really good job. Now, what dynamic microphones do is they are a lot less sensitive mm -hmm. than condensers. So that fan noise that is always present is, it's, usually decently far away unless you're right under a vent. Right. So because it's not as close, the microphone that's not as sensitive isn't going to pick it up as much. And your voice that is closer is going to pick up that. Yep. There's a reason it's used on sound, on, on, on live shows, and it's because dynamic microphones aren't as responsive to sounds far away. So if you're bla blaring sound through a monitor, you're not going to feed back because it's more directional and less sensitive. Same thing happens when recording at home. The best sound you could potentially get is on a $100 58 or, you know, the Sennheiser equivalent or any other dynamic equivalent because they're just not going to pick up all the bad things like the cars down the street, uh, the neighbor two, two stories up flushing the toilet, the <laughs> yeah. dishwasher going on in the basement. Like it's not going to pick those things up. Yep. So sometimes that's just the, the best way to go about it. Yeah. I want to make a point really quick. How much did you say the SM58 was? A hundred bucks. Still a hundred bucks after inflation? Yeah. Perceived value is a really big hot topic in audio, but nobody talks about it. Which is interesting, right? Because we all want to go after the most pretty expensive thing. I know where you're and going with this. So when you just begin, I fall for it now. I'm probably going to fall for it forever because expensive always sounds better. But it all sometimes it doesn't, though. That's the truth. <laughs> it's it's see, With video and stuff, sure, we can see things more objectively. It's a lot harder to hear objectively, I would say. You have to mm -hmm. really, really focus in and train yourself and learn what what sounds good and what, what you're looking for with audio because like there aren't any really visual clues to us. It's it's purely listening and you have no visual clues and and that can make it really tough. This kind of leads us to gear acquisition syndrome because you start change you start chasing shiny objects and these shiny objects have a pretty price tag. And the perceived value you get out of it sometimes it doesn't always equal the value you're actually going to get you're going to get out of it right yeah you've bought stuff that you thought was great and it maybe not have a great as return as you thought right oh, you put me on blast man have you no i bought um <laughs> right before I, I switched from my old studio to my current studio uh i got this a mic set of pencil condensers that also had a large diaphragm capsule on it. So they were both large and small diaphragm condensers. And I'm like, man, these are super versatile, which they are. They mm -hmm. sound great, which they do. And they're a matched stereo pair, so I can use them on overhead, use them for a lot of applications. Really good investment, $1,200, which honestly is not a bad price for a stereo matched pair that has five small diaphragm capsules, each with different polar patterns and a large diaphragm capsule with it's two different polar sweet. patterns. But here's the thing. This is like our faces just light up when you say <laughs> But so here's funny. the thing. That was for all the that was for all the uh, uh, gear snobs out there. Yes. Um, but I'm not going to tell you what microphone it is. You'll have to guess that. But two months later, I moved into my new studio. And my new studio, I purposefully built just 
for mixing. It's just a, a good mixing room because most of my clients are remote. I don't do much rec recording. And the stuff I do is vocals, maybe an acoustic guitar. That's about it because it's mainly singer-songwriter and that kind of stuff. So these microphones that I bought that are really good drum overheads, match stereo pair, I mean, they sound really, they sound good on strings. Well, I don't really record what strings where I'm at. Yeah. So I've broken them out and used them maybe a dozen times. So it cost me $100 per time I've used them. Now imagine if they were in a spot that didn't even, amp like that actually worked against my favor. Mm -hmm. It would it would just be an even worse investment because yeah. I'm actively giving myself more problems by picking up noise and, you know, maybe it doesn't even say I capture sound of my voice the best it, yeah. I want it to, which goes into this next frustration that you could befall you if you don't get a good quality recording at the start of it. And that is if you collaborate. Yes. Now, I, I said I work with a lot of singer songwriters. It's usually just them with their own music telling their own stories. Collaboration does happen, but it's not as prominent. And usually it's collaboration with musicians, instrumentalists, mm -hmm. not necessarily other vocalists or things like that. But even with instrumentalists, if it sounds, oh, this guitar has a bunch of noise, this acoustic guitar has a bunch of noise and background information in it, but this lead vocal is really clean, it brings down the whole recording. Mm -hmm. But for you, where you do rap, hip hop, those kind of genres that feature other artists all the time, that can be almost a death sentence for a song. Big time. Yeah, I've gotten a lot of files that the vocalist, uh, the feature vocalist will come in and it's just a completely different sound and not in a good way because like you're going to have variances between the sound, right? Between setups, between people, but this Wait, is... Are you saying we don't sound the exact same right now? Even though we're on the same mics? That would have been, I mean, that would be a very frustrating podcast if when we that, had very similar voices. When that, you wouldn't who's even talking? know who's talking, you know? Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, case in point though, we are on the same exact mics and we sound different, right? So that, that that's kind of like what we're getting at is the collaboration point is, is really tough if you don't have a setup that's at least up to a certain minimum standard to other people. You'll be the odd one out. If you are the one who was asked to be featured on a track mm -hmm. and you show up by supplying a bad quality recording that mm -hmm. they don't want to use, you're either not going to be on it or people aren't going to want to work with you yeah. because you are actively hurting their sound. And more so vice versa, if you have a not the best quality sound you ask someone to spotlight on you and they have an amazing quality sound, well, now you're affecting their music because now they're featured on it. It's, it's a huge trust thing. Music yeah. is, a, is a very personal business. And also it's like, wow, this, this sounds so much better than this person. Yeah. Like it, it, it showcases the, f it, it puts a highlight on the flaws in your recording when featured with someone who has a, a better quality. That actually sparked a couple of uh, memories for me and stories is I, I've worked with people that, bring their song to me. And this is usually routine work. So we work together routinely and they'll be like, yeah, I got a feature from Instagram. Let's listen to his stuff. And then they'll, they'll have the, the track with them and listen to it in the studio and we'll all listen together. And we just go, wow, that's bad. Just, it's just objectively bad. Either mm -hmm. they're clipping or they have a really bad microphone or the room is untreated or whatever the case, or there's hum in there, whatever the case may be, or the air conditioner, whatever the case may be. Sometimes it's like, it, it takes us out of it and, and it makes the person that you're collaborating with music more unmarketable in the long run. Right. The, it, you might as well invest in good stuff because like Sean was saying, music is music, the music business is based off of primarily trust. And if you don't have the trust with people, especially with your quality, the people are never going to ask you to work together again. Or if you, they do, they're going to have you come into the studio. Mm -hmm. That's going to be the alternative. And yeah. then you got to drive somewhere, sacrifice your time, sacrifice money. And when you could have just done it right in the first place, you know, that's kind of what we're getting at. There's always an opportunity cost down the line mm -hmm. when you don't invest into something at least, at least halfway, at, like you gotta at least make it across some sort of threshold. But so for example, I have an artist that comes through and they're the feature on a song and I get this song and the micro or the microphone, but the actual quality is just not great 
and I'm not saying I'm God's gift to anything, but <laughs> we have setups that are well thought out and we have invested our time and our money, you know, into it. But we kind of reverse engineer the sound of the vocal, you know, most of the time. And we will actually make mine or our setup a little bit worse to try to match it because you want coherency in, in the song. A lot of times in hip hop, there is not a lot of coherency these days, which is pretty shocking, even though even the, even these guys with big budgets can fly people out to go to a studio, book time, do the session, and then they dip. But even nowadays, like, you know, the, the coherency isn't all that fantastic sometimes, mm-hmm. but that also has to do with voicing and everything like yeah. that. But sometimes we will take it a step back and actually make it a little worse. And then that still doesn't feel good because then the artist kind of leaves like, well, I guess this sounds good. And like, if this is what they want, this is what they want. But you never want to have anybody feel that way. No. That's just, it's a terrible way to go about it. Yeah. Terrible way. Yeah. And speaking about how the artists feel when they leave, you know, how you feel at the end of the session, how you feel during the session yeah. is an incredibly important. So another drawback of not having the right gear, the right microphone. We're talking a lot of this stuff we're talking about is mainly for the voice in our examples, but it does apply to like if you're micing a guitar cabinet or micing a cello or micing definitely like, it, it, these things apply. Or even just recording DI if you have like you know a lot of buzz on the bass if you have to angle it to make mm-hmm. sure the frequency is less noise because um, you know happens to me all the time yeah just happened to me in a session yesterday yeah yep. so we should probably talk about awareness of that uh, interference <laughs> like our frequencies and all that stuff back to the the vocal point when you're recording vocals and you've got your headphones on and you're listening to the track and you're singing along with it or the band's in another room and you're singing along with them to get a clean vocal take if you are in a studio or even if you're at home, if like the, your acoustic guitarist is, is sitting across from you and you have your headphones on so you can hear them clearly and also hear yourself. If the microphone doesn't represent your voice in a way that you like, you will not be confident in yourself while you perform. Yeah. Now, you can really speak to this because mm-hmm. what is it, a Townsend? Yeah, Townsend uh, Lab Sphere L22. Townsend Sphere, yep, which UA bought, um, yep. and now they have a modeling microphone, so you can change the way it sounds. Mm-hmm. Um, so you can you can really speak on that, but on this, which is you want a microphone that rep- gets you most of the way to where you want to be so that when you perform through it, you love the way it sounds, and you are confident in the performance that you are given. Music is very emotional, and if you're not in the right headspace and you're not getting the correct feedback from what you're doing, feedback, playback. Um, it's it, not like, it, like shrill, like, mm, Yeah, yeah, <laughs> not that kind, not that kind. Because <laughs> if you have that, then your setup's wrong. Um, but, yeah, so it, if you don't have that, like, that good positive feedback where you're listening to yourself and you're like, man, I'm – I'm really killing this. This is sounding the way that I want it to sound. It's going to be tough to ever record music ever, man. It's just, you have to be confident in your gear too. It is so important because it can be so inspiring and don't get confidence twisted up with value or perceived value of something too. Cause that is also, there's also a fine line there as well, but for the most part, you have to be proud of what you're working with too. Mm-hmm. Because, like, if you look at your setup sometimes and you're like, I have a Behringer, whatever. I'm so sorry, Behringer. But, yeah. No, I'm they a, deserve it. They do. They, <laughs> I have a Behringer, There was no whatever. hesitation yeah. in your response. <laughs> they do. They do. They do. <laughs> they, they definitely deserve it. And and you look at it and you're like, man, this is just not at least a, the next step above. And it's just like, well, I'm good on recording music. Yeah. I mean, music is... Music is emotion. Yeah. It's it, storytelling and yeah. it's emotion. And if you're not feeling the vibe, like not 90% of a good recording is the performance. Yes. I mean, uh, as much as we said, like all this background noise, all, all this other things matter. They really do. Mm-hmm. But even if you have the perfect 
quality recording and the performance isn't there. This is why we saved it for last. It's like the most important thing to capture is the confidence of yourself yes. when you're making the performance. Because if you're not feeling it, if you're not vibing it, it can be objectively full frequency. It can record up to 50 killer... Uh, yeah, 50 Stuff up there sounds great by the way. Yeah. Um, yeah, which is more than double above <laughs> our hearing spectrum. Anyways, yeah. uh, it can be insane. But if... There's no life yeah. in the performance. Yeah. The quality doesn't even matter. So that's another thing to think about is just being having gear that you can rely on, being having stuff you can be confident in, and that really aids you in your yeah. music production. So I guess to kind of you know wrap it all up, the things that you have to be mindful of is think about your space. What are the problems of your space? What are the negatives? What are the positives? Uh, you know, it could even be a positive if you if you have a space that has a really nice reverb to it that you like. I mean, maybe put a microphone you know six feet away from you and just record you and your guitar in one yep. track. I mean, mm-hmm. a lot of the old uh, recording studios were just a really good sounding room and not yep. much effects. Yep. But you have to think about that. Think of your space. Think of this is what I have. This is how it reacts to the space. This is the things that it picks up good. These are the things that it picks up bad. And this is the result that I want for my music. Yeah. And that's all part of it. Another thing you need to do is, is prep. Yeah. Yeah. You definitely need to prep. And and some of that, what, what Sean was ta- talking about too, entails you also having to go out and actually learn what sounds good too. Um, watch a couple of YouTube videos on it. There, there's a couple of really good r- resources that we might put in the show, show notes to help out. There's a guy, uh, I, for, I forget how, I forget what he goes by, but his, his acoustic stuff is really, it's, it's rooted mm-hmm. in all science and he's actually really good. He's very well-spoken and he breaks it down into um, a very digestible, uh, into very digestible information. And it's bite-sized. It, I would portions. say it's pretty bite-sized, although some of the bites he takes out are kind of big. Kinda so you big. might want to chew your steak a little bit more with that one. Gotcha. But th- th- that's like the main thing is that you have to know what which, what kind of sound you're going for. Mm-hmm. And no, you probably won't get there overnight. And yes, you might need to build stuff yourself. And you could sink a bunch of money into some acoustic stuff too. But if you learn how to DIY it yourself too, that's huge also because it'll actually save in your budget and you'll learn how to do this. Yeah, it like, can be really fun if you like building. Yeah. And it's so like even if if you analyze your space of like, oh yeah, this is a really reverby room, but yeah. I still want to record at home. Well, I so said you can get a dynamic, you can get a 58 and that'll really help. Definitely. Or you can record outside if you have, you know, a, a semi-quiet location around mm-hmm. you. There's... Things just to be aware of to minimi- minimize all these. A resource that I, I, I like for our learning that I recommend to a lot of people is the Produce Like a Pro. Oh, he's um, great. Warren? Oh, yeah. Warren. He's great. Because uh, he has a whole series where he starts at the very basics and goes all the way to the very complex. Yeah. And if you want to hear you know, how things sound, uh, he's got a couple of different gear reviews. Mike shoot out just a really good resource. Another good resource if you're looking for a microphone that you think would maybe amplify the positives of your voice, but you don't have a place maybe you can go and listen to yourself to different microphones. Uh, there's a resource called Audio Test Kitchen. Great resource. Great it's resource. Awesome, man. Mm-hmm. As a great website. Yeah. What they do is they shoot out a bunch of different microphones, I think over 900, mm-hmm. on similar sources. They have multiple different genres, but they have a system where as accurate as possible, yeah. they record the same source, and you can listen to the characteristics of each microphone. So if you don't want to go for a microphone emulator, or you just want like a really solid microphone that fully emphasizes yourself to get a good performance, that's a good way to listen yeah. and find out that stuff it's a great great website man great great man it's so good (laughs) but yeah if you if you do that you know you'll have higher quality sounds you'll be you'll be more professional as a musician you'll be seen as a you know someone who takes this seriously because we're all about taking this seriously we want you to make music as long as possible and Absolutely. as much as possible. And the best way to do that is to make a living with it. And Absolutely. if you can be professional with it and put out good things out there that tell people, hey, I want to work with you or tell uh, venues that, hey, we want this to, uh, to perform this guy or tells your fans that we love listening to this and put yourself out in that form, you know, you're going to be able to do this yeah. for longer and longer. Yeah, and we don't mean to scare you either. Like if, if you're listening to this and you're just like, oh, um, this seems like a lot. I'm just going to go hire somebody. You're going to want to do this eventually. Like 
your writing space and everything like that. Mm-hmm. When you bring the, when you take that from your house or from your room or from your apartment, whatever, and you bring it into the studio, that also helps create a better workflow for you, mm-hmm. which means more inspiration in the long run. Yeah, so the better you, demos you have, the better demos you have, the more time you can put into it. So yes, you can go out and hire somebody, right? Which is totally, which is a totally valid way to do it. But you're gonna want to do this eventually. You're gonna want to have a home setup. So just do it right the first time. Invest a little bit of money and time into it. You're gonna learn a few things along the way, and you know what? You're gonna make your music more marketable that way. Yeah. So there's a couple of things in the show notes that we're gonna to include to to really help you out. Yeah. I mean, we could go over the gear itself during an episode, but I think it's better seen on an actual sheet of paper, and you can kind of go spec it out yourself. Everything that we're recommending is going to be non bullshit stuff. So you can be rest assured that. The research that kind of goes into it, it might be specific to you with what you're looking for for specific features. But if you're looking for, you know, just generalized list, we'll have a, probably a few options in each category. Yeah, it's good starting Broken point. down, yeah. And yeah. we'll try to put the price at least of 2023 in there, although it might not be accurate depending on when you're listening to this. But depending on how much inflation kind of goes up more. But anyways. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you're going off in a tangent. Yeah, really oh, I'm again. so sorry. My excuse me. <laughs> oh, no. If you never do that little, on this podcast. A little Freudian right? slip. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, so we'll have a link into the show notes on a gear list that might be better suited for you. Might include something about genres on there as well. Yeah, well, we'll have a couple different ones. Since I specialize in, because I don't want to recommend something that I don't necessarily speak on. Mm-hmm. So because I specialize in singer-songwriter, folk, uh a little bit of classic rock and country, but mainly singer songwriter and folk. I want to be supplying my list is going to include stuff that I've actually worked with or heard results from that Likewise. other people have recorded with that are specified to those genres. So if those are the kind of music that you make, check out my list. Yep. If you make hip hop or rap, I don't use that kind of gear. Don't check out mine. Check out Brandon. Check out mine. It's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anything that's very vocal based. You can definitely check out mine for sure, but it is mainly vocal based within like electronic kind of stuff. Like you can you can say pop, hip hop, whatever the case may be, those kind of genres themselves. So you can definitely check it out. Yeah. So those are gonna be in the show notes of this if you want to check them out and kind of get a starting place of where you where you should go. Yeah. And on top of that, if you guys could also do us a huge favor. I'm not uh, gonna sit here and beg, but I will. What? <laughs> rate us five stars. I'm not going to do it, but I am. Rate us five stars. <laughs> not even rate us. Uh, if you could just give us feedback on the podcast so far. I That'd said, be awesome. This is one of three episodes we're dropping at launch. Um, we were going to decide later, but I'm deciding now. This is one of three episodes we're yes. deciding at launch. So, you know, please give us some feedback on it. In the show notes, once again, there's going to be a way for you to give us feedback. You can leave a review. Suggestions uh, for suggestions later for topics. If you have any questions, you can always let us know. You can always reach out to us at our email too, which will also be in the show notes as well. Yep. Awesome. We haven't made it yet, so we can't tell you verbally, but yes, it will yet. be there. It's going to be there. It's going to be there. It's going to be awesome too. So yeah, please give us some feedback. We look forward to hearing your thoughts about what we're doing and suggestions on what to do next. Yeah, that'd be awesome. It'd be awesome. It'd help us out. Give us kind of a roadmap with what you guys want to hear too. And uh, we'll sprinkle some of the stuff that we want to talk about along the way, even the stuff that's not fun. So there will be some uh, pop quizzes. So be ready. And with that, recipes made, dinner served. <laughs>